the individual all of us we are also brahman and you take a look at the world and the individual and you find everything in the world perishes including us we also perish so you tend to believe that brahman is perishable he senses this misunderstanding because you see the only thing you can do is misunderstand there is no possibility of understanding so it's very clear to him that word the moment you say i know it he understands you don't know it you haven't understood a thing that's when the upanishad he says i don't know it i know it i don't know it not that i don't know it i know it then it sounds totally confusing to us but the fact of the matter is brahman is an entity which is beyond the intellect and therefore you cannot understand brahman you can't express it through words you can't see brahman you can't there's nothing no equipment you have with which you can perceive brahman and yet he does such a magnificent job of it a brilliant portrait at explaining brahman so scientifically in such a way that at the end of the chapter tomorrow evening you'll have some at least a vague idea of what brahman is so this is what he's saying uh, in these few verses 12 to 15 he says brahman is the substratum of both it is the imperishable foundation of the perishable world even after this he doesn't end here why doesn't he end here because our concept of brahman is still limit, limited to the universe the world which is not the correct portrayal because brahman is all pervading is infinite it exists beyond the manifested world in its pristine glory in its unmanifest form and therefore he and he introduces a third aspect which is uttama purusha in verses 16 to 20 and says brahman is the supreme being beyond the universe at the end of it you stand a gasp and say i don't understand then he ends the chapter because then you, he knows you're close to getting the right picture so here in 12 he says the splendor of the sun see the light of the sun represents the light of atman and deliberately he uses the light of the sun because in the previous verse in 11 he says atmani avasthitam residing in the self now when he says this residing in the self means the closest deep within you and you have a concept of something dark unknown frightening so immediately he corrects this misunderstanding by the light of the sun adityagatam tejah atman is tejah is brilliant it's not dark and dingy the sun itself is able to give this tremendous light and heat because of atman enabling it so atman is that force the power that enables the sun to give light and heat and sun mind you is only one of many many thousands of millions of suns in various galaxies in the universe so when he says light of the sun is not referring to just this sun many many suns the light of the sun sun is direct light moon reflected light fire created light so there are three sources of light that we are familiar with all three he says know that light to be mine what whichever kind of light you are exposed to either fire which is you yourself have created or the sun direct light or moon indirect light know that light to be mine it is when he says light he means consciousness krishna is speaking of this all pervading reality which enables every entity everything in the world to function so in yet you stand under the sun and say there is no sun similarly you we are right see atman is all pervading atman is everywhere and yet you stand there and say god atman where is atman so there is a disconnect somewhere the disconnect is you don't have the vision with which to see the what you are trying to see with is the two fleshy eyes you don't have the as they say jnana chakshu 
the light of wisdom with which to perceive that there is a divine force that is functioning in the world for which you need to at least temporarily set aside your desires your attachments your obsession with petty trivial and inconsequential unimportant things in life it is this that gets us down bogs us down completely so when he speaks of this the splendor of the sun and the moon which illumines the whole world he's trying to at least temporarily get us liberate us from the little little things that you are tied down to and expose your mind to something higher once you get a glimpse of it it will come back the all the petty things will come back but at least you are aware that there is something beyond this trivial obsession of yours so what see it's like this when he speaks of light you don't know what light is you only know what you're seeing let's say for instance i keep this book on my palm and i ask you what are you seeing what do you say the book what do you see the book i take away the book and put place the pointer what do you see now pointer i take that away and keep this on my palm what do you see the glass now what do you see nothing <laughs> you say nothing but what there is is the palm why do you say nothing because your focus is on the object that i place on the palm similarly brahman is the substratum of everything that you see but because your focus is on the objects and beings on the world you are unable to see the substratum therefore what he says is see what you're seeing when i place various objects on my palm what you're seeing is not just the object you're seeing object plus light suppose i were to keep the light the pointer on my palm and i promise you i give you my word of honor that i will not tamper with it my palm will be exactly as it is with the object on it and all the lights are switched off what do you see do you see the pointer no so therefore right now what you're seeing is the pointer plus light now if you want to decipher what is light light is whatever it is that you see minus the object so this is how uh, j krishna murti for instance defined it defined atman brahman as objectless awareness so earlier he said dwelling inside and so he's corrected that by saying no it is the tejaha in the sun moon and fire everywhere so then you understand it is this conscious principle in you that enables you to be conscious of everything that you are aware of he now moves to 13 gama vishaja bhutani dharayam yah mojasa आत्म so he says i sustain dharayami aham ojasa ojasa energy and becoming the sapid moon i nourish all plants so sunlight is direct light which provides vitality to all beings on earth even for us you, you know you have to go to a place where which does not have sunlight particularly in winter like there are regions in canada you go it is so cold there and uh, it's further north so they have hardly 3 hours of daylight per day when people wake up it's pitch dark and in the cold they go to work 
in their offices, schools or wherever they are, there is artificial light. There is no, they have no access to uh, sunlight. There is no sunlight, there is daylight. And when they go back home, it's pitch dark again. You know what happens? They get so completely de devoid of energy that their productivity actually comes down. And therefore it is that to encourage people, anyway people don't work, so they give extra, one week extra vacation if they take their holidays in winter. The Indians who live there are thrilled to bits because they can come back here in winter and there's plenty of sunlight here. It actually depresses them, they go into depression because there's no sunlight. See, you and I in India have no idea what it is like to be deprived of sunlight. We complain there's too much sun. The next time it's hot, don't complain. Think of these guys in Canada who get depressed because there is no sunlight. So that's what he's saying here, that I energize, I sustain all beings with the energy of the sun and becoming the sapid moon I nourish all plants. Moonlight which is reflected sunlight uh, is supposed to nourish plants therefore uh, for instance paddy seeds are exposed to moonlight because they feel that this is what uh, nourishes them. It increases the, the, the yield that you get if you expose the paddy seed to moonlight but whatever it is. the force of Atman, the, this divine power manifests as sunlight, gets reflected through the moon, both sunlight and moonlight nourish beings and vegetation. This energy is called Parashakti or Adhyashakti, Parashakti, Supreme Being, Adhyashakti, primeval force. I nourish all plants and then he goes on in the next verse to complete the cycle. You see how it's, it's very um, systematically drawn. He starts with the sun, the moon, vegetation and then he moves on to how it goes into living beings and completes the cycle and he says, I am that mighty force, the substratum behind both the macrocosm, the sun, moon, etc. as well as the microcosm, the individual verse 14. Aham Vaishvana Robhutva Praninam Deham Ashritaha Prana Panasamayutaha Vaishvana Robhutam Telling the body of all beings that Vaishvana has fire in the belly is what has fire in the belly. That fire in the belly is Atma. Dwelling in the body of all beings as Vaishvana Joined to prana, inhalation, and apana, exhalation, I digest the fourfold food. So, in effect, what he's saying here is, in this portion, that every single entity, wherever you look, wherever you go, whatever you do, it is Brahman that is supporting it. So, in effect, what he's saying here is, there is nothing secular in the world. Everything is sacred, everything is divine and yet our country, the spiritual base of the entire world has declared ourselves to be secular. This is the problem, we become, we turn from being a spiritual uh, society to a secular society. All we need to do is reconvert from secular to spiritual. So. This verse is particularly important. Most people know this verse by heart. I would suggest that you learn it by heart. And it's chanted before you actually sit down to a meal, along with verse 25, I think, of chapter 4, which says, Brahmarpanam, Brahmahavi, Brahmagnav, Brahmanahutam, Brahmaivatena Gantavyam, Brahmakarma Samadhina. So the theme in both is the same that everything is Brahman. When you embark on any sense enjoyment, not just eating, anything, with this concept that everything is Brahman, it, uh, it takes on a sattvic flavor. In the olden days, even now, if you see a traditional person, 
very few of them left when a lady buys a new sari what will she do she'll first keep it offer it to god as it were keep it in the temple put a little kumkum on it only then wear it not like us be before you buy it only you try it in the shop so <laughs> there where is the question but similarly with food before you eat you offer it to god as it were remember that brahman god is the basis and in this verse what he saying is i am the vaishvanara jatharagni this this power of digestion within you which is cooking the food within you so there are various stages of cooking the first stage is the conversion of minerals to vegetation from inorganic food to organic food that is done by nature outside of you the second stage is you buy the vegetables and cook it in the kitchen this food that is cooked in the kitchen when you eat it is then digested by vaishvanara this force the power of digestion it is incredible i don't know whether you've ever thought about it without thinking we all that we do is, is one way street we just keep eating whatever there is junk food healthy food everything but it never occurs to us that there is this mighty power of digestion within us and as long as this digestive ability capability is there everything goes on smoothly with you the moment you get an upset stomach it it upsets your equilibrium completely so much so that you're not able to think even so it's a digestion is a very important aspect of your life and that has to be maintained when the food is digested properly then you develop hunger has it ever occurred to you how wonderfully this hunger comes upon you this afternoon someone was uh, telling us that the brain is programmed automatically in such a way that between the your first morsel the first uh, morsel of food that you take in at a meal exactly 20 minutes after that the brain sends out a signal of fullness you feel full you may not have uh, noticed it because we are constantly disregarding this signal of fullness and we continue to eat till till you are you can't get up from the table <laughs> but amazing this is the first time that i was exposed to such a thing and they have noticed that because of this in western countries they have what is known as soup so the moment you eat the soup if you eat that soup slowly enough and you eat your food slowly enough you get the signal of fullness much earlier than you would if you were gobbling large quantities of food but i mean this is not a lecture on reduction of weight but uh, the fascinating part is who decides that exactly 20 minutes later and it's really strange that if you sit down and actually time how long it takes you to go through a reasonable meal it's exactly 20 minutes and it strikes you suddenly as my god there is this tremendous power this divine force that's taking care of every aspect of your life without your knowing it you don't know it but if we were to become sensitized to these forces this is just one thing digestion what about sight what about listening hearing what about the skin feeling a simple thing like a, a gush of wind how sensitive your skin is that it picks up these signals who put it all in place what put it all in place and the more you think about it you stand a cast at some power beyond you which is maintaining everything so beautifully so perfectly and yet in this beautiful perfect world there is you and me feeling this sense of inadequacy here is the human being sitting there and saying oh there is no god there is nobody looking after us there where is the abundance so when you say that god leaves you alone and right through your life you're 
full of this feeling of deficiency that I don't have enough, I don't have enough. And because you feel this, however much you have, you still feel I don't have enough. There's a lady here some years ago, right here in Bombay. She had so much of everything. She had wonderful people around her. She had a battery of servants, all of whom were divine people, really good people. She had all the wealth in the world, she had all the support systems in the world and yet within herself, for years together, she was constantly complaining. I shudder to think what must have happened to her. So, this is what it is. So, wake up before that. Wake up to this abundance, is what he's telling us. This Vaishvanara. So, this Vaishvanara digests the food and when the Vaishvanara digests the food, Prana, Pana, Samayuktaha, the Prana and Apana, there is something in you which balances the intake and the output. Everything is balanced perfectly. Imagine if you were to only eat and no excretion. Suppose you were to only breathe in and no exhalation, suffocating. If you were to, like this. This, everything is perfectly balanced and therefore you, are, you and I are able to function properly. And this pranamaya kosha, the physiological functions, once the food is digested, the energy, uh, the nutrients are distributed equally by circulation, which is one of the pranas. And then he said, this is how I digest the fourfold food. Chaturvidham, because there are four ways in which you can ingest food. You swallow liquids. You chew solids, then there are certain kinds of food that you lick, like a what? ice cream cone. Yeah. And the fourth is suck through a straw, a cold drink, correct. So the digestion, cooking is now complete, it circulated everywhere and that is how you gain this energy. So this force which starts from the sun and the moon through vegetation and now come to you and let's see what happens. 15. Sarvasya chaham rudi sanni veshtaha matas prutir jnanam apohanam cha vedaisya sarvaya meva vedaha vedana prutira veva chaham I am dissolved in the hearts of all. Many knowledge and their loss arise from me. I am that which has to be known by the Vedas. I am the author of Vedanta as well as the knower of the Vedas. So in this verse, he is now having completed the cycle, uh, verses 12 to 14. Now he summarizes. Summarizes by saying, I am the substratum of everything. I means Atman. Now, deliberately he says, I, because each one of us is to say, I, not Krishna. Because that same Atman which was in Krishna, in Christ, in Muhammad, in Buddha, exists in each one of us. And all we have to do is tap into that and we'll get to the same state as all these people did. So, it's not the exclusive privilege of a few, it is available to every one of us. Where do you find it? installed in our own hearts, within us, the core of every human being, all beings in fact, is Atman. Then he says, memory, knowledge and their loss arise from me. You gain knowledge and the process of gaining knowledge is supported by Atman. Then it is stored as memory. This is, again is a fantastic thing. How you remember so many things. If you take a look at um, your memory base is much more than any computer. Then, one step further he goes and their loss. The fact that not only you remember, but you forget so many things. That's another amazing thing. Unless you forget, this is, this is a blessing because if you were not capable of forgetting, life would become intolerable. All the negative things that have happened to you from childhood to now, if you were to remember it with the same um, intensity, that's the word, thank you, same intensity as you felt when it happened, 
uh, you would collapse. For instance, a death in the family, every one of us has experienced. The moment it happens, you feel like you're a cat.